to sow seed. I want you to grow my kingdom. I don't want you to hold it tightly for yourself. And here's the thing. My pastor would always say, if you think it's yours, hold on to it. Oh, mic drop moment, right? But that's the truth. It's not a have to. It's a get to. It's another way we worship the Lord. I just don't want to worship the Lord with my voice or with some drumsticks in my hand. I want to worship the Lord with everything that I've been given stewardship over. Amen. So let me pray. Father, we love you so much, and we are grateful to be your kids today. We have so much to be grateful for. We have so much to celebrate. And right now we pray over your tithes, our offerings, because we know, Lord, you don't need resources like this, but you use them to further your kingdom, to grow your kingdom. We thank you for that. We thank you for the hearts and the lives that are being touched, even right now. In this room, anybody watching online, over in the kids' area, those kids that are hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ right now, we thank you, Father, for every bit of seed that's planted because you take that and you multiply it and you grow it and you turn it into something beautiful for your glory. We love you. We pray over this. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, we all say together, amen, amen. God bless you guys as you give. We made it as easy as possible for you. We have giving boxes. As you walk out of the door, we got a couple of them. And also, we have an app. You go to the app store. You search out your hilltop, and we have a giving tab right on the app. If you don't have the app, I highly recommend it. We're trying to keep that updated with good content all the time. Every week, our services go on the app. So, hey, if you don't have the app, I recommend getting it. And also our website, go to yourhilltop.church, and we have a giving tab right there. God bless you guys as you give. Hey, who's ready for the word today? Come on. Come on. It's Sunday fun day. We're going to dive in. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And I want to read this to you in a couple different translations today. Is that okay? I want to read this out of the New Living. I, I'm usually preaching out of the New Living translation. It's a, a translation I really love. Um, many Greek scholars, theologians believe the way the New Living translation is translated was very similar uh, as w- the way we talk to each other today in our modern culture was it's the way it was translated was very similar to the way the Greek speaking world back in the New Testament would speak to each other. So I'm a huge fan of the New Living Translation, but I want to read also Matthew 6, 30, actually 31 through 34 out of the Message Translation. How many of you guys enjoy the Message Translation? Come on, let me hear it. Woo! Okay. The Message Translation. It's actually translated by the man. He's passed now. His name's Eugene Peterson. And Eugene Peterson, just an amazing man of God. And he set out to be a Bible translator. He set out to be a Bible translator, but then God called him into being a pastor. And he translated the message translation. So let's just dive right into it, Matthew 6, 33. And I want to tell you guys, this is one of my absolute life verses. This was a verse, the first verse I ever memorized. How many of you guys can remember that first passage of Scripture you memorized? How many of you guys remember that? Yeah? Okay, okay, okay. Come on, John 3.16, I love it. Matthew 6.33 was the first passage of Scripture I memorized. I went to church with my grandma. You may have heard this story before. Um, and in my grandma's church, a small town, rural Michigan, in the thumb area of Michigan. When you're from Michigan, you hold your hand up. That's how you tell everybody where you're from. Right here. Right, th- right there in the thumb of Michigan. And it was just this small town church. I think I was one of maybe 15 people there. I definitely was the youngest at the time. I, I think I was about 11, 12 years old. And I walked into this church, and when you're there for the first time, they give you a scripture, a verse, and it's framed. They put it in a frame. It was really, really nice. I thought it was just the coolest thing ever. And so I took that home. I put it in my room right next to my door. So every time I walked out of my room in the morning, I had to walk past it and read it. It was Matthew 6, I'm going to say it out of the King James Version. That's the version I memorized first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But I want to back it up. I want to read it out of the New Living first. I'm going to start at verse 31. Now, I want to say this. Jesus is speaking here, and he's not just speaking about money and possessions. In Matthew chapter 6 right here, in this particular 
passage, it's he's talking about money and possessions, but it is so much more, you guys, so much more. And this is what we're kicking off a new series with right here. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, here's out of the message translation. It is so, so good. And in the message, it goes in chunks, so it actually backs up to verse 30. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. How many of you believe that today? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. <laughs> to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality. God initiative. God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Woo. Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for that amazing message from you. You help us deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. And you tell us not to worry about it, not to be fearful of the things coming down the pipe. Lord, we know you've got us. You hold us. You carry us. Your provisions are more than enough. And you call us to seek you first. So, Lord, we just give you all glory right now for what you're going to do. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help your words sink deep into our hearts today. Soften our hearts. Tear down our defenses, Lord, anything we have put up that would stand opposed to your word and your truth. We ask that you would just break that down right now. And we say, Lord, have your way. We are available, and we want to seek you first. In Jesus' name, we all say, amen, amen. So we're kicking off a new series, y'all. If you haven't figured it out, it's called Seek. Say Seek. By the way, how many of you guys were blessed by last week? The five and five. How many of you guys saw that five and five? So good. Now, it's amazing how God works in your life. It's amazing how God sees your beginning from your end, and he knows what you need. And that scripture that the Lord had me internalize and really get into my heart first before any other scripture, that Matthew 6, because later when I was a young man in college, I was living life on my own terms, doing things my own way, making a mess of things very fast. How many of you guys can relate to that? I was not living for the Lord. Straight up, I was not living for Jesus as a young man. I was studying music in college. A lot of you guys know my story. But I remember I, I attended this church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I rededicated my life to the Lord. And they had this amazing worship team. And me being a musician, I wanted to be a part of that. Every time I walked in church, they had this percussion set up. They had this guy playing congas and bongos and timbales and shaking shakers and all this crazy cool stuff. They even had a gong. And every time I walked in, I was just drawn to that. I said, oh, Lord, I want to I I get up there. I want to use what you've given me for you right there. And so I went and I auditioned for the worship team. But, again, I had some major things in my life I needed to get sorted out with the Lord. Again, how many of you guys can relate to that? Come on. I auditioned for the worship team. The worship pastor said, hey, I want to put you on the schedule this weekend. But you got some things you got to sort out with the Lord first. And how many of you guys know when God corrects you like that, sometimes you're just like, yeah, I don't want to hear that, okay? And we stiff arm what God wants to do in our heart and in our life. And so I started to justify things in my own walk like, oh, yeah, okay. Everybody else on that platform is all perfect, right? That's what my own justification in my head. 
But the reality was God wanted to do a work in my life, but I had to put him first. I had to seek him first. And so I can remember sitting in my apartment, spending some time with Jesus, and I said, Lord, I want, I want to step out. I want to use these gifts you've given me for you, but I'm not able to jump on the worship team. And God, this is one of the times, one of the few times that God audibly spoke to me. And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it. I'm not trying to say there were lights beaming down in my apartment. But I heard what I heard. How many of you guys know that feeling that you hear what you hear and you cannot deny it? You know it in your knower. God said to me, son, this is what I have for you, but you have to put me first. That was it. And I can remember that moment experiencing such peace such joy, but also this massive sense of correction. But when God corrects you, it's a beautiful thing. How many, how many guys can say amen to that? Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. A lot of times and most times it's a removal of something that needs to be removed. And so as we start this series called Seek, I want you guys, I wanted to set that foundation so you know how near and dear this is to my heart. Because at the end of the day, this is such a crucial part of our walk with the Lord. You know, we just spent the last uh, however many weeks, I think we're about six weeks into it, of the summer of love, learning about the rev- the revelation of God's love for us. But listen, we're going to piggyback after that, and we're going to say, listen, this is crucial. Not only can we live in that place of knowing how much we're loved, but we have to seek after the Lord with all that we have. we got to put him first. Because if we don't put him first... We're not putting him where he needs to be. And I want to say something pretty strong. Some people, you know, and and I'm not throwing shade at all if you've ever said this, but you kind of order your life, right? Like God first, family second, this here, this here. Listen, no matter where you put God in the order of your life, he's always first. That's who he is. He does not accept any other place because He gets no other place. He always has been first. He always will be first, right? The Bible says he's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, right? He lives outside of the bounds of time. God is always first place. It's just a matter of are we putting him in first place in our life? Because if he's getting second or third or fourth, I challenge you, God never wants second, third, or fourth. And when we put him second, third, or fourth, we're putting something else. We're placing a God above Yahweh in our life. And I know that's a strong statement, but church, hey, come on. If we're not going to push some buttons here, what are we doing here? We're not here for cute, cuddly church. It's It's who we are. We're here to be sharpened and refined. And we're here to have those, ooh, that hurts so good kind of moments. God has an amazing journey for you. He has plans for you. He has purposes for you. He has a destiny for you to step into. How many of you guys believe that? He's got open doors for you. But they come to light when you put him first. Not when you put the stuff of this world first. Not the earthly goals. Not you gotta you gotta be tuned into those heavenly goals, right? Amen. So here's what I want to say throughout the rest of today. When I'm going to hold the mic up, and when I hold it up, I want you to say, my God, say it, is more than enough. Come on. Woo, you got it one more time. Yes, you got it. A plus. A plus, you pass. All right. Let's dive in. Let's dive in. Let's talk about this word seek. I want to give you three pointers Three tips, three tools for your tool shed. You know me, I like to walk out of here with some tools for your tool shed, amen? The first thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes is your attention. Your attention. When we're talking about seek, the truth is you got to give God your attention. You follow me? We give God our hearts, but then what? Right? 
We say, Lord, I give you my heart. But then what? How do we in the daily and in the practical walk out our faith? And it starts with giving the Lord your attention. The thing in the daily that communicates to God and everyone else around you where our heart is, is who or what gets our attention. What we give the most attention to every single day, it gets the most real estate in our heart. And I want you to think about that statement because sometimes we give attention to a lot of things that we don't even realize we're giving attention to. Sometimes we get caught in those traps of complacency, those traps of being entertained, those traps of consuming instead of giving our attention to the Lord. What we focus on first and the most is a good indicator of what is taking priority in our hearts. And, you know, I'm I'm coming from Kansas City, Chiefs Nation. You know, Kansas City Chiefs football is a big deal, y'all. I remember on Sundays, it would just be, I'd look out on the platform and be an ocean of red and white and yellow. Chiefs Nation. You better hope that, you know, game time is not landing close to around church time because most people would stay home watching the game. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I would see people on their phones watching the game during church. Now, now if, you, if you have done that, again, no condemnation here. This is a condom, condemnation-free zone, okay? I want you to know that no shame here, but I will say this. If you have ever done that, I think God's got something better for you than a football game. I'm just going to say Okay? (laughs) But what we focus on first and the most is a good indicator of what's taking priority in our hearts. Job, possessions, hobbies, marriage, titles, politics. Growing up in Michigan, there's a saying, you have these deer season widows. During deer season, you'd have women say, yeah, I'm a deer season widow, meaning her husband was in the woods nonstop, 24-7. She never saw him all deer season. When I was a, a young man, I you know, God does a work in our hearts, right? Amen. Aren't you grateful for the work he does? When I was a young man, I wasn't very good with finances. I'm just being real with you. Can we be real for a minute? Now, we, my wife and I, we, are, we try to be good stewards of what the Lord has blessed us with. We try to be financially responsible. We're Dave Ramsey people, the debt snowball, you know what I'm saying? Financial peace university. So the Lord's done an amazing work. But when I was 19, 20 years old, and I was actually, I had a good paying job. And if you looked at where all my money went, I'm, I love food. Food's my primary love language. Openly admit it. I spent almost every single one of my dollars on either food or musical instruments. Okay. I don't even know how I made it this far. Okay. I, 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 I had a roof over my head. Thank, thank the Lord. Right. But we can look at those things in our life and we see where our attention and our focus really is. Because in that season of my life, I was not living for Jesus. And so I want to say this one more time. One more time. Whatever you focus on first and the most is a good indicator of what's taking priority in our hearts. So let that just be uh, uh, something to challenge you today. Is it okay if we challenge each other today? Let that challenge you. What are you giving your attention to? What are you really seeking in your time? Because just like I had to do as a young man, I had to crucify my flesh, my fleshly desires for whatever meal I wanted, whatever musical instrument I wanted. I said, hey, Lord, I want, I want to go higher. I want to step into that destiny you have for me. So it means crucifying some of that flesh. And I want to say a statement that, I want you to write down on your notes. If you're taking notes, I want you to leave with this statement today. The most important thing you can do as a follower of Jesus after you've given you, given the Lord your heart is to give him your attention. You follow me? I want to say it one more time. The most important thing you can do as a follower of Jesus after you've given the Lord your heart is to give him your attention. God tells us in Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. That means, Lord, I got to give you my attention first, not all this other stuff. 
not picking up my phone and checking the, the social feeds or checking whatever's going on or getting to that text or this text. Lord, i got to seek you first. got to give you all my time. Now that, I'm not saying you got to keep your head buried in the prayer closet all day, every day. Now, that's not a bad thing. But listen, we all live life, right? But it's inviting the Lord, seeking the Lord first in every single moment as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, uh, in your vocation, whatever you're doing, going about your routine, and as a student. Listen, I'm going to seek the Lord first, right? It's an awareness. It's giving the Lord your attention. It's giving the Lord your attention. Why? Because my God, he got it. He got my God it. More than enough. One more time. All right. All right. All right. We have to give our attention first to the kingdom. So now, what is the kingdom? Here's point number two. What is the kingdom? The kingdom. We're not talking about geographical lines, you guys. Seek first the kingdom. We're not talking about these geographical boundaries. And when you look at a map, maps change over time. You've seen all the maps that have been made over the course of human history. It's amazing how much some of those boundaries and those lines have changed over the years. We're not talking about that. The kingdom is the domain of the king. And you're like, yeah, no duh, right? The kingdom is the domain of the king. It is the place where the king rules and reigns supreme. So to seek first the kingdom is to seek that place where the king, King Jesus, rules and reigns supreme. And like I said in the beginning, he is first place. He always has been. He always will be. But we have to give him that first place seat in our own hearts. We have to say, Lord, I'm seeking first that place in my heart where you rule and you reign supreme. That means whatever you tell me to do, wherever you tell me to go, no matter where you're telling me to put down roots or whatever you're talking to me about, I'm going to listen and I'm going to obey. The difference between our earthly understanding of a kingdom and the kingdom of God, it's not geographical. It's in us and then it springs forth from us. We are kingdom carriers. Say, I am a kingdom Carrier, come on, because my God is, come on, come on, come on. We bring the kingdom with us, and with every single surrendered heart to Christ, the, king, the kingdom grows and the kingdom advances. And so what I'm saying to you is you, we have to seek first the rule and reign of Jesus as King Jesus, Yahweh, are you following me, church? Like I said, he's always first place, but we got to give him that first place seat. So what are we, if, and I, let this be a heart check moment, let it sink in. Are we giving anything else first place in our hearts? And I'm not even talking about bad things necessarily. Because listen, I love my wife and I love my kids, but I have to love Jesus more than my wife and my kids. Because the more I love Jesus, the better husband I'm going to be, the better father I'm going to be. I have to love Jesus more than each and every one of you guys because the more I love Jesus, the better pastor I'm going to be. I got to seek him first. Amen. Because my God is. I want to kind of wrap up with this third point. We've established what the kingdom is. It's that place of the rule and the reign, supreme King Jesus. Here's what we need to be aware of. The promise of seeking first. The promise of seeking first. Everybody say that. The promise of seeking first. You see, Matthew 6.33, it's a command. Seek first the kingdom of God, right? It's a reality that, hey, if you seek first the kingdom of God, right? Right? It's a reality for living, and it's a promise. And sometimes we can skip over that part that it's a promise. Do you know how many promises throughout Scripture God has kept? Ooh, all of them. He's never not kept his word. 
And that can be hard for us to wrap our brains around because we deal with people all the time every day that don't necessarily follow through with their word. Amen? We're all imperfect people. We're all imperfect. We all fall short. But God always keeps his word. He is a covenant-keeping God. And all we have to do is open up to a few key passages in Scripture, and we see how many covenants he's kept, big ones. We see Noah, the story of Noah in the rainbow. I saw a rainbow coming into church today. It was beautiful. Coming here this morning, saw a beautiful rainbow, and I was reminded it's a covenant. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13. God said this rainbow is a sign to you, a covenant that I will never flood the earth again. Abraham and his descendants, Genesis 15, 18, Genesis chapter 17. You see, God made a covenant with Abraham. He said, I will make your descendants. I will number them more than the sand on the seashore. And I actually met with a couple of men from Israel this week. And it was incredible. And they were talking to me about how the very existence of, of the nation of Israel is a miracle in and of itself. There's never been a people group throughout the course of history that has kept their tradition, kept their culture, stayed together without even having a physical land, been exiled and brought back into a nation. Prophecy after prophecy has been fulfilled as we look at just the nation of Israel alone, and that's a covenant from the Lord all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. That in and of itself is a miracle, church. Come on. God keeps his promises outside of the bounds of time. We see Moses in the nation of Israel, Exodus 34. God kept his promise, actually renewed his covenant between him and the people of Israel right there. He said, I exiled you out of Egypt. I'm renewing my covenant with you, my covenant that I had between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in fact, it's a beautiful beautiful study. I don't want to get on it. I'm deviating from my notes a little bit here, but when you look at the covenant between God and Abram, without the H, right? In Hebrew, that H, ha, it means to breathe. And so after that covenant moment, God changed his name to Abraham because he breathed on him. Come on. Ooh, all right. That's a different message. I'm not going there today. We see the covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, between God and David, King David. How many of you guys know about King David in the Bible? God said to David, your descendants will be seated on the throne forever, forever. God was referring to Jesus, that Jesus was going to be coming out of the line of David. And in fact, after Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. God said, this is my dearly beloved son, right? That word right there in the Hebrew, it's actually the same word that David used in referring to Solomon. Solomon was David's son, and it doesn't mean biological son. It carries the authority of the name. You see, when God said, this is my beloved son, he was talking about Jesus. He was saying, this is the one who carries my name and my authority. Come on. I say all that to say we can trust every single promise that God gives us. And Matthew 6.33 is a promise we can trust that if we seek God first, we seek the kingdom first, we seek the rule and the reign of Jesus putting him first place, then he sorts everything out. Come on. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, we can trust him and know he's working it out. In fact, Scripture says God works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his plans and purposes. We seek the domain of the rule and the reign of the king. We live according to his rule and reign above everything else. Nothing else gets first place. God promises with covenant faithfulness. Come on, covenant faithfulness that he will give you everything you need. Because my God is come on, one more time. My God is do you believe it? We seek him first. We seek him first because we trust him. Come on, we seek him first because we trust him. We trust him because our faith is in him. And our faith is in him because he is so very faithful. How many of you guys today could raise your hand and say, my God has been so faithful to me over the years? Come on. Come on. 
even in those times when you haven't seen it, you weren't aware of it, maybe it didn't get your attention. And what I want to challenge you with today, give you a little bit of homework, seek him first this week. Give him more of your attention. That is never a bad investment. Come on. Bible says in the book of James that we're to draw near to God and he draws near to us. We're going to seek him first. We're going to continue to unpack this in the weeks to come. We're going to look at a couple other passages of scripture that talk about seeking God. But I want to ask, could you all bow your heads, close your eyes? I want to pray as we close today. Just quiet our hearts, Lord, in your presence. We quiet our hearts. We quiet our minds. We say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That when we put you first, you take care of us. (laughs) We thank you right now that even when we don't put you first, you still take care of us, Lord. Because you're so merciful, so graceful. So gracious towards us. We thank you right now, Lord, for your every bit of provision. You meet us right where we're at. You give us exactly what we need. And right now we acknowledge that you are first. Right now as a people, we acknowledge that you are first. We give you first place. We say, Lord, come sit and throne. First place in our hearts right now. We want to seek you first. Help us this week, Holy Spirit, to give you more of our attention. And I want to back that up. I want to say, Holy Spirit, help us to give you all of our attention. All of our focus. All that we have to bring, Lord, we give it to you. We seek you first. With everyone's eyes closed, everyone's head head bowed, I want to read Matthew 6, 31. One more time for us. Just let this sink into your heart. Let this sink into your heart today. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. We thank you for that promise today. We thank you for that promise. We hold on to your truth. We hold on to your word. We love you so very much, Lord. In Jesus' name, we all say together. Amen, amen. I hope this blessed you today, church. You guys been blessed today?